everybody, my name is Allison Harrell with the Fort Bend Museum, and today we are gonna talk all about Mirabel Bonaparte Lamar, or as you might know him, the second president of the Republic of Texas. Now, um, Mirabel B. Lamar was born on August 16th, 1798, near Louisville, Georgia. His parents were John and Rebecca Lamar, and they had two sons, and Mirabel was the second son. Now, Maribo was highly educated near Eatonton and Milledgeville, and um, he really took heart to that education. He was described as an avid reader, an oil painter, an expert horseman, a fencer, and a writer of verse. That last quote, uh, that last quality, the writer of verse, is one that followed him his entire life and it was sort of something that he found great solace in. Um, even though he really valued his ed education and he was reportedly accepted into Princeton, Lamar did not attend college. Instead, he moved in 1819 to Alabama, where he opened up a general store with a partner and also got controlling interest of the local newspaper. Now, these two business ventures did not go well for Lamar. Um, in 1823, he ends up moving back to Georgia and um, just abandoning both of those ventures because they had kind of failed. Um, when he moves back to Georgia due to family connections, he is able to get a job as the private secretary of the newly elected governor of Georgia, George Troop. Uh, Mayor Bobby Lamar really took a shine to George Troop's policies and as his private secretary, he toured around and he also gave speeches on behalf of Troop about what Troop wanted to do. It was during these travels that Lamar met his first wife, Tabitha, and they married in 1826. They had a daughter named Rebecca Ann Lamar. Now, in 1828, he moved his family to the newly founded Columbus, Georgia. It was there that he started another newspaper. This one was called the Columbus Inquirer, and this one actually was pretty successful. So the Columbus Inquirer had a very political bend to it. It um, definitely championed the politics of Troop and Lamar, and it did really well. This also helped launch Lamar as a political force, and he was elected to the Georgia State Senate in 1829. Now in 1830, tragedy strikes. Lamar's wife, Tabitha, had had tuberculosis for a number of years, and that was part of the reason they moved to Columbus was to try and nurse her to better health. Unfortunately, in 1830, she dies. And this is the first time that Lamar has suffered a loss like this in his personal life. And he reacts to it in a way that he will repeat a number of times throughout his life. So she dies and he ends up traveling for a few years to sort of sort himself out and get over this loss. And he also takes that time to write a number of poems. So when he returns to Georgia after traveling and after dealing with the loss of his wife, he finds that he doesn't have the political traction that he used to have. So he tries to run for the State House of Representatives and his political party won't even put him on the ballot. He ends up having to run as an independent and he fails that election, he doesn't get elected. Um, he tries again to be elected into another position and once again, he's just not finding any traction. Um, it was at this time in sort of mid 1830s that his brother ends up dying. So once again, he's faced with a loss and so he travels. But this time he travels to go and visit a friend. So he knows someone named James Fannin who has moved to Texas to become a slave trader. And Fannin likes it in Texas. So he goes to see Fannin, he goes to see Texas, and he kind of looks around and thinks, you know what, I like it here. Not only did he like it here, but he also really liked the Texas um, independence movement that was brewing pretty heavily in around 1835. So um, he decides, you know what, I'm gonna join up with this. So he goes home to Georgia to grab some supplies, gets his horse, gets his sword, and heads on out. When he returns to Texas, he joins Houston's army and he finds that he's just in time to join the final battle. It was the day before the San Jacinto battle when Lamar spots two Texans surrounded by the Mexican army and he swoops in on his horse, manages to rescue them both. And the entire Mexican army is so impressed by this maneuver that they all salute him. And so the next day, uh, right before the battle of San Jacinto, he is verbally promoted to um, head of the cavalry and he does really well in that battle. 
Um, he was appointed soon after this as the Secretary of War under David Burnett. Uh, Burnett had been appointed the president of Texas in sort of the interim time while they were fighting um, for their independence. So when the first round of elections came to elect who would be in charge of Texas, um, that's when Sam Houston was elected president first, and actually Mayor Moby Lamar was elected vice president. Now, he didn't spend most of his vice president term in Texas. He actually went home to Georgia for quite a while to sort of um, talk to everyone there. He came home to a hero's welcome, sort of gather more of his stuff and really more efficiently move to Texas. When he comes back to Texas, he finds out that his presidential campaign has started without him. It was written into the Texas Constitution that you were not allowed to be the president of Texas for two terms in a row. So they knew that Sam Houston couldn't be the president next, and some people really didn't like what Houston had done with Texas, so they wanted Lamar to be the next president of Texas. Now, Lamar's campaign to be the president of Texas was a little bit of an odd one. Both of his opponents died before the election in 1838. So even though Lamar, um, in theory, had two opponents running against him, he actually won unanimously in 1838 and became the second president of Texas. Now, we're not going to talk about what he did during his presidency at this time. That's for another video. So um, we're just going to skip to the end of his presidency um, when he went back home to Richmond and retired. So here we are in Richmond. Um, his house is no longer standing. And he was living here for a while until in 1843, his daughter Rebecca dies. And he responds as he's responded to every death in his life by traveling and writing poetry. So um, the poem he wrote upon the death of his daughter is one of his more well-known poems. Um, and we will talk more about the poems later. But he ends up traveling for a little while. He ends up working for the United States government for a little bit. He advises people. He talks to people about different things. And then in the early 1840s, he ends up joining the army. Mary Bobby Lamar ends up joining Zachary Taylor's army in the lead up to the Mexican-American War. Um, when Texas becomes a state of the United States of America, everyone knows there's going to be a war. And that's because Texas has always claimed that the Rio Grande River is their southern border. And Mexico has always claimed that the border is actually the Nueces River. So there is a huge gap between those two rivers that is highly contested area. And for the United States to claim the state of Texas as one of their own, it becomes necessary to define borders. Um, so everyone knew that when Texas became a state, there was going to be at least some squabbling over what the border was. So the United States President Polk sent an army to a little town in Texas, and this army was very interesting to me. Um, and that's because after the war, a lot of those soldiers ended up moving back to this town and staying there. And because they did this, that is actually a lot of the reason that the town exists. Um, and that town is actually the town of Corpus Christi. But um, the army itself I find really fascinating because the number of really big players that were involved. Zachary Taylor was in charge of this army and you might notice that he later goes on to become the president of the United States. And another person in that army later would also go on to become the president of the United States, and that was Ulysses S. Grant. So I didn't know that Marabobi Lamar was a part of this army. He helped to organize two of the counties down there. So San Patricio and Nueces County were organized in part by Marabobi Lamar. Uh, they actually elected him to serve as their state legislature representative in 1847. So in 1851, Maribo's life finally kind of takes a positive turn. He meets his second wife, Henrietta Maffitt, and they have a daughter named Loretto Evelyn in 1852. Um, now Maribo B. Lamar publishes his book of poetry in 1857. It was 244 pages long. Um, and then in 1859, he dies of a heart attack in his home in Richmond and is buried in Morton Cemetery. There are a number of memorials to Lamar in Fort Bend County. So we do have the statue of him in front of the historic courthouse. Um, we also have Lamar's grave in Morton Cemetery. Uh, the school district in Fort Bend County, or one of the school districts in Fort Bend County, is called Lamar Consolidated ISD, or Lamar Consolidated Independent School District. Um, and there's a number of things throughout Texas that are also named after Lamar. Um, including universities and counties and at least one town. 
So though Lamar was only the president of Texas for one term, and um, he never served in any official capacity from Texas for the United States, but he definitely left his mark on Texas and he definitely left his mark on this area. Hope you enjoyed today's video.